You see, I got to thinking about the past couple weeks, and I thought, you know, the past couple Sundays have been, well, they've been pretty intense. I mean, a couple Sundays ago, we had Elena Stein come and share her story of her family, the Holocaust. It was a moving, moving sermon. And, uh, but it was, it was heavy. You know, a lot of good conversations were born out of that. And people were wrestling with some of the things were said. And the idea of violence in the world, how do you respond to violence in the world, all those things had a little service. And then last Sunday, Stephanie came up here. And while it was a joy-filled sermon, you had all received news that the Campbells and John Stephanie were going to be moving to North Carolina. And so there was that element of, you know, loss, that we're going to miss them. And, and so you heard that word. I hope you heard the rest of her sermon. <laughs> And it just so happened, it, I mean, isn't God an amazing God? That the text that she was preaching on was Elijah being carried away in a chariot of fire. I'm looking for the fire in the chariot to come. I'm like, dear Lord, please let that happen. That would be so cool, wouldn't it? I'm like, you saw stuff in the lead in a chariot of fire. Oh, yeah, yeah, the red it's a chariot of fire. So. But I thought, you know, those two sermons were, I mean, it was pretty intense. There's a lot to deal with emotionally. And so I thought today would be a great day to preach a light, fluffy, happy, fun-loving sermon. And so I thought that it would be good to focus on scripture. Because, because we know how much you all love talking about stewardship. I mean, every Sunday. Sunday, people walk out of the church, shake my hand, and they say to me, when are we going to talk about stewardship? <laughs> I love talking about stewardship and money and giving all of my money to the church. It brings me joy. <laughs> right? I mean, I see you all in your own little groups gathered together talking about, man, stewardship. That's what it's all about. I mean, isn't that what's exciting? I mean, isn't that the predominant conversation the church has with each other? And while I might joke about that a little bit, there's some truth in there that we probably should focus a little bit more energy and time on stewardship. After all, we spend a lot of time talking about prayer and devotion and worship and service to others. And then there's stewardship. <laughs> you know, that personal thing, money, giving, sharing. I don't like talking about that. Is that true? I mean, it's a subject that we all wrestle with, and to be honest with you, while I joke, and that's why you all are laughing, <laughs> is that we don't really like talking about it in church. I don't mind. Thank <laughs> God. Which <laughs> is exactly what I was about to say. The only time I ever hear somebody say, we need to talk more about stewardship, is if it's another clergy friend of mine, or a member of the stewardship education plan of <laughs> all the time they come to me like, Roy, you know, we need to do more teaching people how to pray more fervently. And I said, you know, that's great. We can do that. Let's talk about stewardship too. Well, no, we don't even have that. <laughs> I once had a lady come out of Cornerstone and uh, she was shaking, was shaking hands like I do usually. And uh, she turned to me and she said, you know, I don't believe that you believe in the literal translation of God's word. And I said, what do you mean by that? She says, well, I just got the gist of your sermon that you're not somebody who believes that every word of the Bible is literally God's word. It should never be changed. And I looked at her and I said, do you tithe 10%? And she walked away. <laughs> I mean, come on, let's be fair, people. <laughs> something affects us, let's talk about your wallets, amen? I mean, isn't it true that if you want to find out what is your primary concern and focus in your life, just give me your checkbook and I'll find out. And you will find out from my checkbook that my daughter takes a lot of money. <laughs> Those little kids are expensive. If I'd have known that, I don't know if I have one. But I love my daughter. I'm glad that I can spend that kind of money on my daughter. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm in trouble now. But I mean, we need to be serious about this I mean, stewardship. What does it mean for us? We're being challenged to respond 
for the call of stewardship as a practice of Christian discipleship. In other words, it's just as important as your prayer life, as your worship attendance, as your service to others. It's right in there with all of those things. And I always say that what stewardship does for me personally is it saves me from myself. It reminds me that I'm a participant in a story bigger than myself. And by giving back, uh, I realize that I'm not bound in this kind of narcissistic, self-interested world. You know, when I give, and Leslie and I sit down and we talk about our stewardship practices here at Cornerstone, which we do all the time, uh, you know, we're, we're not giving for what we get out. We're giving for all of you. And I hope you're giving the same way. Because if it's all about me, we're never going to enter into the joy of giving. And the scriptures tell us that God longs, desires for all of us to be joyful givers, to step into that joy, to realize that our participation, and this is the word we use at Cornerstone a lot, together, makes a difference in the world around us. It does. And so you hear language about stretching, uh, and we're going to get to that in just a minute, but a lot of times we kind of create excuses for ourselves, don't we? Um, and this is one that I've been wrestling with lately because we use it here at Cornerstone. I, I've said this a bunch. Uh, you sit down with somebody and you talk about giving or stewardship and then you say, hey, listen, you know, I'm not interested in how much because that's between you and God. And I can only speak to this because I am speaking personally. But I have used that line in my own life a bunch as an excuse not to give. In other words, to kind of continue to live under the illusion that I have such a close relationship with God that I know what God is requiring or asking of me. <laughs> and I don't have to let anybody else know. My bishop calls and, and writes letters to all of us clergy in the United Methodist Church and asks us if we are tithing 10%. He just comes out and straight asks. And I always respond, yes, because I do that practice in my household. But there have been many times that I wanted to say to the bishop, it's between me and God. <laughs> yeah. Because what we use that for is to say, it's none of your business. Yeah. And I have to tell you, that cannot be found. That line is not found anywhere in scripture. <laughs> Nowhere does it say it's between you and God. And I'll agree with Lisa. Lisa uses the line a lot of times when Lisa left go, great hand, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Lisa uses the line a lot that God doesn't need your money, and that is true. Our God doesn't need your money. And so to think that it's between you and God is kind of a lie to ourselves because God has called you to be the church, the body of Christ. And so I want to change that line to be actually it's between you and the church. Because we've been called into a relationship of accountability. We've been called to hold each other accountable to the practices of Christian discipleship. And one of those that we avoid holding each other accountable to is stewardship. Now my toes are hurting just as much as yours are right now. Because I'm preaching to myself as well. Amen? Amen. And part of the challenge here at Cornerstone is that we're inviting all of you to stretch a little this year. As you fill out commitment cards and you prayerfully discern what direction God would have you to go with your giving. And so I actually wore tennis shoes today. Not because they match my soul, which somebody asked me if I was wearing these because they match my soul. I'm wearing them because it's important for us to remember that we're all called to stretch in life before we actually can move ahead. I shared that story with my friends who are all runners at the Ragnar, and they, every time we stop, they're all stretching. And I said, why are you stretching so much? And Cameron Lashbrook turned to me and he said, because I can't move forward unless I stretch. And that's just true. And so whenever you see your tennis shoes in the closet, or you're putting them on your feet this week or this year, or whatever you put tennis shoes on your feet, I want you to remember that you're called to stretch. And stretch in all areas, not just your muscles. And we're called to stretch in our prayer life. We're called to stretch in our worship and our service to others. All those areas of discipleship, we're called to stretch, including stewardship. You know, it's important to remember that Jesus says, So I say to you, ask. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. In other words, God has poured out God's abundance on all of us. And Jesus is reminding us that we need to be forward in asking. 
And we shouldn't be ashamed of it. So ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened. And Jesus goes on in that passage to say, if you ask, you will receive. Now, unfortunately, a lot of churches use that and manipulate that text into thinking that this is some kind of prosperity message. In other words, unless you, you pray and you ask for God, that somehow God's going to pour down millions of dollars and you can get a house on the beach, right? But that's not what God's talking about. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is saying, ask, and you will receive the forgiveness, the grace, the love, the life that God and only God can give through Jesus Christ. And that is the abundance that we receive. And in that, we respond in joy to the world around us. It's not about the accumulation of material goods or things. It's about how we live and embody the gospel in the world. It's how do we live our lives before others? How do we enter into a relationship with one another? Ask and you'll receive the light, the forgiveness, the means of reconciliation, of making things right again. And you will be a person living right in the midst of the world. You and I are the resources God gives the church. Mm. We're it. And when we unite our hearts and our lives together in that way, it makes a huge difference to the world around us. And if we stretch just a little more, oh my gosh, God's going to do tremendous things. I got to thinking about asking, though. <laughs> and that word ask, I think it's interesting because in the NRSV, that word, uh, so I say to you, ask, ask is capital, which means it's important. Ask. But I got to think, I had like flashbacks to elementary school and middle school when you used to have to ask the girl. <laughs> what pressure that was. I mean, I, I have to say, I wasn't really good at it. I, I thought girls liked talking boy talk. And so I'd like do boy kind of things, and they all run away. Do y'all ever pass notes like this, anybody? Yeah? Y'all participate in that game? You know, the biggest, biggest part of asking, and my grandmother used to say over and over again, she'd say, Roy, go ahead and ask them. All they can say is no, and I'd respond by saying, yeah, but the rejection is terrible. <laughs> and ask them. There's always that one guy. I had a couple guys in my school upbringing, elementary school, middle school, the one guy, and I'm saying guy intentionally, this is not a sexist comment, it's just that I'm a guy, okay? Um, and the one guy, you know, did very little. Matter of fact, he was kind of a homely little guy. <laughs> you know, the average guy. That's even a little lower than average. Okay? And for some reason, you know, as hard as I was trying and some of the other guys around, you know, being a great athlete, shooting great hoops, lifting weights, you know, playing on the football team, you know, all of that stuff, this guy just walk in the room and the, and the girls would just flock to him. I thought, man, I've got to learn this guy's secret. Now, just to give you a little contrast, there was a guy in middle school by the name of Derek, and he had like a a lot of ladies following him all over school. And I was amazed how he did this because he was homely. <laughs> I mean, let me just put some comparison up here. Okay. Darren kind of looked like the third grade Roy. Who <laughs> <laughs> right. I will say is who I will say is deadly cute. But, but if you picture Darren being third grade Roy, the girls who would hang out with Darren were like Jennifer Lawrence. <laughs> and I just wondered, how does this happen? And so I just started paying attention to Darren. You know, scientific method, observe, write it down, figure it out. So I watched Darren. You know what Darren did? This is the sermon title. Y'all should be able to get this. He asked. He had confidence. He didn't invite them to go out with him. He didn't send them notes. He just walked in and said, Margie, will you go out with me? <laughs> and nine times out of ten, they said yes. And I figured it out. All you have to do is ask. And my grandmother's right. The worst thing that could happen is somebody says no. So keep on asking. And isn't that what Jesus is calling us, the people of faith, to do? Ask, 
and ask and ask again. And Jesus is asking us, rise up, church. Be the body of Christ for the world. Be the resources the church needs for the world. Share the love of God and go forth into the world and ask, welcome, celebrate all people. Keep doing it. Even though they say no, just keep on asking. Amen? Amen. Glory. Glory. <laughs> Ask and it shall be given unto you. Which got me thinking. And this kind of came to me over the past couple months. Because I have spent some time recently with some of our very faithful financial members of the church. People who have been blessed. And I have sat down with them around the table and I have asked them intentionally if they would participate in providing resources to meet our goals for the end of the year. And guess what? Every one of them I sat down with responded. And they were very glad to be asked. And I am very thankful, by the way, to those families. And they have set us up to reach our goals in so many ways. I mean, we've already raised $20,000 towards the goal and we have some more to go. And we need you participate as well. But I went home and I thought, you know, those families that I asked, they're asked by so many people. Um, matter of fact, you're being asked all the time, aren't you? When you drive by McDonald's or you're watching TV, the whole world is asking you for your resources. Where are you going to put them? And I got to thinking about those families I was sitting down across the table from and I thought, you know, They've been through this before. <laughs> it's not that you're always there like, this is the first time somebody's actually asked you because they have, they've been blessed with resources. I mean, Lisa and Stephanie can tell you that they do a lot of that in their own work. And people respond. They look forward to being asked. And then I had a little light bulb go off. You know what we do most of the time in the church to the rest of the congregation? Is we just invite you. We kind of play it down a little bit. Hey, would you think maybe kind of consider being a part of this? We don't ask. And so I'm setting up the table today. You gotta use your imagination a little bit with this. You and I are gonna sit down at the bistro. We're sitting across from each other at the table. I'm trying to catch everybody's eyes. Because this has to be a personal and intimate moment. Will you help us reach our financial goals for the end of the year? Will you give significantly towards reaching that goal? And will you stretch in what you're going to give in 2015? I'm not inviting. I'm asking. In the name of the Father, and of the Son of the Holy Spirit.